Hello folks, and welcome to the ninth part of the in-depth analysis of The Last of Us. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the game's one and only single-player expansion, a little piece known as Left Behind. This is going to be a first for me, because since this DLC is quite short, uh, I'm going to attempt to cover it all in one video. We're going to start with a summary of the story, and then move on to some analysis. In said analysis, I'm going to try to cover as much as possible. I'll be talking about the overall story, the characters, the themes, and how this affects the main game. And as always, and this basically goes without saying at this point, but there will be some major spoilers. So with that said, this is the story of Left Behind. Left Behind actually has two plotlines running parallel to each other. One takes place in the present day, and the other takes place in the past, more specifically, three weeks before the events of the main game. Let's deal with the present day one first, since it's less eventful, and honestly, less interesting. It takes place between the fall and the winter chapters. Basically, it's about Ellie looking through an abandoned mall as she tries to find some medical supplies for Joel. During her search, she is attacked by both the infected and hunters from David's group. Eventually, she finds the supplies and gets them to Joel. She patches him up, puts him on some kind of sled, attaches the sled to Callus, and rides off. And that's basically it. It's fairly obvious that this section is here primarily for gameplay purposes. As such, it's more about putting Ellie in interesting combat situations as opposed to adding to the narrative. And truth be told, I don't mind. While I'm obviously here for more story, I also want to play some more The Last of Us, and the gameplay style of the main game wouldn't really have fit with the prologue chapter. So while the narrative in the present day bit is fairly thin, it serves its purpose regardless. The really interesting parts, as well as the main selling point of the whole DLC, is found in the prequel chapter. So let's move on to that, shall we? The chapter starts in Ellie's bedroom at the military boarding school as she gets a visit from an old acquaintance, her old friend, Riley. From what we can gather, Riley left Ellie about a month and a half ago. They clearly didn't part on good terms, and since that day, Ellie has presumed Riley to be dead. She now returns to Ellie to show her what she's been up to. Here. Look. No way. You're a firefly. Riley then says that she wants Ellie to come with her. Where she wants to go is a bit uncertain, but Ellie hesitantly follows. Along the way, Riley talks a bit about how she found the fireflies and a bit about her initiation. She also tells Ellie that Marlene doesn't want her joining up. She wants her to stay at the school where she'll be safe. In fact, it turns out that Marlene doesn't want Riley seeing Ellie at all, as she's afraid that she will get her into trouble. Obviously, she is unaware that they're together this morning. It turns out that they're headed to an abandoned mall. Their first stop is a costume store, which seems to have some kind of Halloween theme going on. They fool around here for a bit, they try on different masks, they play with the skull version of a magic 8-ball and some other stuff. As they leave, they come across two floor model cars. Riley dictates that they take one car each and try to break all its windows as quickly as possible. Whoever loses has to answer a question. The outcome is dictated by player skill, but in this scenario Ellie wins and delivers the immortal quote Yes! Rick fucking master! The player then gets to pick which question they want Ellie to ask. In this particular scenario, she asks why Riley left without telling her, to which Riley does not give a straight answer. Instead, she says that they're close to the thing she came here to show Ellie. At this time, it's commonly believed that only certain buildings in the city still have power. It turns out though that the whole city still has power, and that the military has just flipped the circuit breakers. Riley gives Ellie the honor of turning the power back on, and then leads her down another corridor. Before they enter the next door, Ellie says that she's really glad that Riley is not dead, and that they're back together. In response, Riley says that she didn't mean any of the things she said before she left. Ellie, in return, makes fun of her sappiness. They push open the door to reveal the mall illuminated, and at least partially operational. The girls take this opportunity to enjoy every attraction they can. They go on the merry-go-round until that breaks down. They play around in a photo booth until that too breaks down. They come across another pun book that Ellie quotes from for several minutes. They even get to ride an escalator. At the top of the escalator, they come across an old arcade. It's long been a dream of Ellie's to get to play a video game. Unfortunately, the only machine with power is also busted. Even so, Riley tries to simulate the experience by asking Ellie to close her eyes. She then tells Ellie what would be shown on screen, as well as which buttons she would have to press. Ellie thoroughly enjoys the experience, however when Riley says that she wants to continue exploring, Ellie says that she has to go back. Riley insists that she has plenty of time, but Ellie explains that she has no strikes left, and that they can just pick this up tomorrow. Riley then reveals that this is her last day here. Marlene is sending her to a unit outside of Boston. 
Ellie is at a loss for words and eventually asks Riley why she brought her here. Riley replies that she wanted to see her, but when Ellie asks why she brought her here specifically, Riley says that she doesn't know. Ellie then says that she thinks that Riley should go and that they should just say their goodbyes here and now. To this, Riley says that she is going to check out some music that's playing in a nearby room. When she catches up to her, Ellie says that Riley has no right to be pissed at her. They had a good thing going, but then one day Riley tells her to fuck off and just leaves. She also says that if she feels too guilty to leave, then she is giving her an out. Riley answers that she is risking her life to be here, and that it wasn't guilt that made her cross half the city. She admits that she's done some stuff that she doesn't know how to take back, but she's trying. She then reveals what she's been lugging around in her backpack all this time. Two water guns that were apparently taken from them some time ago. Ellie says that they're gonna have a showdown with these, and then they'll talk. As previously, the outcome of the match depends on how the player does. In this scenario, Ellie loses. After the water war, Ellie says that even though she sounded like an asshole when she said it, she meant it when she said that Riley should go. She has dreamt of this for a long time, and as she puts it, who am I to stop you? Riley replies, the only one who could. Ellie insists that she should go and that they will see each other again someday. Riley hands Ellie the water guns, saying that she will have no use for them. As she's packing them down, Riley asks Ellie if she still has her Walkman. Ellie replies that she does, so Riley takes it and hooks it up to the nearby stereo system. The song that comes out is none other than I Got You Babe by Eddie James. Riley then invites Ellie to a dance up on one of the counters. After a while, Ellie looks deep into her eyes and pleads with her not to go. Riley responds by removing and dropping her firefly pendant. Now. I'll figure it out. But I don't think Marlene's gonna go. Wait. The happiness is short-lived as several infected storm into the room. The two girls make a mad dash for the exit, but the runners are everywhere. After a couple of close calls, they finally see their way out. Some scaffolding is set up next to an open window, and that's their exit. Riley manages to climb it, but as Ellie attempts to follow, it gives way. She falls and plummets back to the floor, where she's immediately pounced on by an infected. Riley gets down and manages to get it off of her. The moment it dies though, Riley is blindsided by another one. Ellie gets up and rushes over, and slashes the runner's throat with her switchblade. Ellie notes that it seems the coast is clear, when Riley points something out to her. Ellie. Ellie, your arm. No, 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 no. <sighs> Frustrated and devastated, Ellie collapses at Riley's side. Riley says that the way she sees it, they have two options now. The first one is to bite the bullet. It'll be quick and painless, but she also admits that she's not a fan of option one. She then presents her with option two. We fight. For what? We're gonna turn into one of those things. There are a million ways we should have died before today. And a million ways we can die before tomorrow. But we fight for every second we get to spend with each other. Whether it's two minutes or two days. We don't give that up. I don't want to give that up. My vote? Let's just wait it out. You know, we can be all poetic and just lose our minds together. What's option three? Sorry. Let's get out of here. Let's move on to the discussion and the analysis. When talking about this content, I think a good place to start is at the title, as I've seen several people be confused about it. 
As far as I can tell, the title could refer to three different things, none of them mutually exclusive. The most literal interpretation of it is that it's referring to Joel, as Ellie leaves him behind to go look for supplies. While it is a very possible interpretation, I dare say that this is probably not what the creators had in mind when they named the DLC. I would say the most likely interpretation is that it's referring to what happened to Ellie and or Riley. It could be that Riley is the one who got left behind, as she died from her infection and Ellie did it. In fact, it could be said that Riley represents the whole life that Ellie now has to leave due to her situation. In that sense, the title is referring to the life that Ellie can no longer go back to. There is a third reading for this though, and that is that Ellie is the one who got left behind. She was supposed to die alongside Riley and then join her in death, but she's still here. This can also be tied into Ellie's survivor's guilt that we see develop over the course of the main game. People around her keep dying, yet her turn never seems to come. Death continues to take those she cares about away from her, leaving her all alone. In that sense, she's been left behind. Regardless of how you interpret it though, it's hard to argue that the title is not about loss. Whether this refers to a loss of life, situation or a friend is up for debate. As for me, I would say that one reading doesn't exclude the others. I think that it's on some level referring to all three scenarios that I just mentioned. So if the title is referring to loss, is that also the main theme of the DLC? I would say it's one of them but not the only one. I would say the other main theme is, well, let's call it brutally coming of age. If you think about it, a lot of the things that Ellie and Riley do in this DLC are typical kid slash teenage stuff. They sneak out, they go to places that are off limits, they have a shug of alcohol, and in general just do things that are quote unquote forbidden for youngsters. In other words, they are very much acting their age despite their circumstances. They can play around and have fun and just for a while forget about the fact that they're actually living in a post-apocalyptic world. In the end though, it's this recklessness that gets them into trouble. Riley wants to dance, so she puts on loud music, seemingly forgetting that this is a surefire way to attract the infected. Ironically, it was also the music that triggered the kiss and gave them those few seconds of what seemed like pure joy. This adds another, even crueler twist to their fate. Their love and the potential life they could have had together is another thing that's taken away from them when they're bitten. After all of this, Ellie is forced to mature and steal herself even more than before, because there is always a chance that another one of her loved ones may die. She is forced to grow up under some of the cruelest circumstances imaginable. As such, I don't think it's a stretch to call this a coming of age story. Not a very conventional one, mind you, but I think the point still stands. One last thing I have to bring up is that the two plotlines of the DLC actually run in parallel to each other. They both take place in malls, and they both feature Ellie and the person who is closest to her at that given time. They both also feature a scenario where Ellie faces the prospect of potentially losing this person. In the prequel, Riley eventually dies and Ellie has to deal with that loss. In the present day, she's hell-bent on saving Joel because she does not want to go through that process again. She also remembers what Riley said, that every second you can spend with a person is a second worth fighting for. And so Ellie fights to keep Joel alive. It's possible to argue that if it hadn't been for Riley, Ellie would not have the strength and determination needed to save her new companion. And so this time, she's able to keep the one she cares about alive. I think that this is a good segue to start talking about Ellie and Riley as characters. Let's start with Riley. If I were to describe her in one word, I would call her impulsive. She seems to do pretty much whatever comes to mind, with little consideration to the potential consequences. This can be seen not only throughout the DLC, but also in the manner in which she left Ellie. She's also obviously very driven, given that she became a firefly at a fairly young age. It also seems that she really resents the military. Out of the two, she comes across as the more quote-unquote adult and adventurous. At the very least, that's the image she projects. At the same time though, she appears to be fairly contemplative. She even says so herself, that she's uncertain how to handle things that she feels regretful about. This could actually be the very reason that she takes Ellie to the mall. She doesn't know how to make up for the fact that she hurt her, so she tries to do it by giving Ellie what's essentially one big present. However, she's not just driven by guilt, she even says so herself. It's possible she wanted to get Ellie here for a chance to show her her love. This was possibly done subconsciously, but uh, I'm just speculating at this point. One thing we see repeatedly is that she has a tendency to get caught up in the moment. This is particularly evident when it comes to playing the music, as I mentioned earlier. This also ties into what I said earlier about her being reckless. At the end of the day though, she seems to be very loyal. She more or less sacrifices herself to save Ellie by coming back for her, even though she could have escaped. I mentioned earlier that she seems to be quite contemplative, and this is also evident when she thinks about death. She's quite sentimental about it, and is keen to hold on to every single second they have left. And as mentioned earlier, this was a sentiment she was able to pass on to Ellie. 
Overall, I think Riley does well in playing her part as Alice Foyle. She's adventurous and daring, and she seems to be a lot of fun to be around. It's easy to see why Ellie misses her. Like more or less every single The Last of Us character that I have analyzed, she plays her part brilliantly. Now let's move on to Ellie. Now obviously I've already talked at length about her, so I'm gonna be talking about her character in this chapter specifically. Compared to the main game, she gives off a younger impression here. She comes off as somewhat hesitant and much more abiding to the rules. Well, at least compared to Riley. She also seems to be more naive than we're used to. For example, they come across a tent of someone they knew who also owned a horse. The guy in question is already dead, so Ellie says that the horse must be out there somewhere being really scared. She doesn't seem to consider that the horse is most likely also dead. Overall, she just seems to be a bit more, I guess, blissfully ignorant about the state of the world. In the story, she demonstrates that she has knowledge about media from before the outbreak. At least literature and also possibly movies. I say this because she makes references to both Dracula and Oz. It's possible that she learned about these in school. Also, I think it's kind of interesting to think about which pieces of media would be preserved and still referenced in the post-apocalyptic world. Anyhow, back to Ellie. While she's obviously mad at Riley, she clearly still wants to be close to her, which may be the whole reason that she came along with her in the first place. As with Riley, I wonder if she knew how deeply she felt about her. I get the feeling that Ellie knew more than Riley, as Ellie is the one initiating the kiss. Now, regarding her sexuality, as with Bill, the general reaction to this revelation was overall positive. There were, however, not too unexpectedly, a few weird ones. The one that stood out to me though were people trying to explain away why this kiss came about. People were saying things like, oh this doesn't mean that she's gay, she could at the very least be bi, and oh this is just a teenage thing, people her age are usually very confused about their sexuality. While these statements, unlikely as they may be, aren't per definition false, I still had to ask, why do we feel the need to try to explain this, or better yet, explain it away? Can't this just be a girl liking a girl? Do we really have to try to find a reason as to why they like each other? There were also those who said that we shouldn't make a big deal out of this because that just brings attention to the fact that they're not heterosexual. To that I would say, let's not even pretend that we're anywhere near close a state where gay couples are given the same amount of space as straight couples in gaming. Let's give praise where praise is due, especially to those who break new ground within this medium regarding this issue. And that is something I would say that Naughty Dog has done with Ellie and Bill. So yeah, you can bet your ass that I'm going to bring it up, and that I'm going to praise it to the high heavens. I apologize for getting a little sidetracked there, but that's something I've been itching to get out of my system for a while now. Anyway, once again, back to Ellie. During the escape, we see that she's quite capable in combat already, possibly due to her training at the school. After the bite, she is way less calm than Riley. I would even go as far as to say that she has a bit of a fatalistic attitude. Still though, she remembers everything about this and these memories will make her stronger in the future. Overall, I think it's great to see where Ellie came from and how she became the girl we meet in the main game. I've said before that I think that she's probably one of the most important characters ever to have been put in a video game, and I still stand by that statement. Probably even more so after experiencing this DLC. She continues to be absolutely incredible, and she is the damn near perfect vessel for this story. I would like to wrap this up with some closing thoughts, more specifically, what I liked and didn't like about the DLC. If I had one complaint, it would probably be that the present day plotline really doesn't have a lot of plot going on. As I said earlier, I didn't mind it too much, but it was the first time in this game I felt like I was chogging through a gameplay section only to get to the next story bit. This might also have something to do with the fact that the mall we're in in the present day really isn't that interesting. Compared to the other one, it's just so grey and dull. I mean, yeah, it's winter, obviously, but still. Also, for a piece of now even standalone DLC, it is quite short. Now, don't get me wrong, what we actually get is absolute gold, but if the story wasn't as good as it is, I would probably have felt a little ripped off. That said though, I would still say it's worth the money, obviously. Switching over to what I liked, I would say the story. Basically, every last single bit of it. It's wonderful to get some more backstory on Ellie, especially this bit, which basically comes to define her for the rest of her life. As I said earlier, Ellie is great in it, Riley is great in it, the setting is amazing. There really isn't that much to complain about here. I absolutely love how we can see the events that befall Ellie play into her character in the main game. Now we understand why she's so afraid of being left alone and why she trusts Marlene so blindly. Even on its own merits, it's a great short story and the perfect kind of story to tell in an expansion. So yeah, overall I really, really like Left Behind. Simply put, it's a fantastic addition to an already great game. 
And that is gonna do it for this episode. Thank you ever so much for watching. This is the second to last video in this series, which feels a bit strange to say actually. The last video is basically gonna be a final discussion on how I see the game after having worked on these videos for so long. Also, if there are any retractions or clarifications that I want to make, they will be done there. I'll also talk about some other stuff, but you'll see when it comes out. If you enjoyed this video, then you are more than welcome to give it a like. And if you like the kind of videos that I'm making and you want to see more, then there's always the subscribe button. And if you want to keep up with what I'm doing and how the next video is coming along, then you can always follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Links are in the description. Again, thank you so much for watching. Until next time, take care.